Good morning and welcome everyone. As the director of the Center of Genomics and Policy, it's an honor for me to welcome you to the 2023 Barton Opera's inaugural lecture. We have an outstanding speaker for this lecture, and we want to maximize our time with him, which is why I'm going to keep my opening remark uh, very short. The Center of Genomics and Policy was actually created by Professor Barton Oppers over 25 years ago. It's a center that works at the crossroad of law, medicine, and public policy. And applying a multidisciplinary perspective and collaborating with national and international partners. The Center of Genomics and Policy analyzes the socio-ethical and legal norms influencing the promotion, presentation, prevention, and protection of human health. Regarding Professor Barton Oppers, I said I would keep my remarks short, so I will only say that out of all the people I know in the genetic ethics and policy sphere, no one but Professor Barton Oppers has had such a transformative, international, and lasting impact on the field. Just thinking about uh, the, pol the laws and policy she's initiated, the organization she's helped to develop, and the outstanding legal scholars she has trained throughout the years is enough to make one very dizzy. After the talk, Professor Manzawati will tell you more about the prize uh, that will be awarded for the lecture and what it stands for. Uh, but for now, I would like to call to the stage the chair of the Department of Human Genetics at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science and a longstanding friend and supporter of the Center for Genomics and Policy, Dr. Will Polk. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jan. I'll try not to shout. <laughs> so um, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Eric uh, Meslin who um, has a three decade long uh, career, which has spanned clinical, academic, government, and not-for-profit. So really the whole, the whole uh, menu from uh, soup to nuts. A common thread uh, on, this, uh, on his work throughout has always been a focus on the ethical, social, and policy implications of health, science, and technology. So it's a perfect speaker here to honor uh, Barta, who's made so many contributions that we just heard from Yan, born in Toronto, as a BA from York University and an MA and PhD from Georgetown University in Washington. After doing his PhD, he came back to Canada, uh, started the, uh, something a bit similar, the Clinical Ethics Center at Sunnybrook Health Sciences, and then uh, a year in Oxford, and then ended up at the NIH with, uh, when Bill, Will, Bill Clinton was, uh, was running the show and was providing advice to the White House and to the US Congress on stem cell science, cloning, international clinical trials, genomics, so really, again, the whole gamut of relevant topics. And after that, he moved to Indiana, where he was for 15 years, running the Center for Bioethics and Associate Dean for Bioethics at the IU School of Medicine. Uh, and the, the list goes on, um, in, involvement in Oxford, Australia, Toulouse, the WHO, UNESCO, OECD, Genome Canada, I mean, it's sort of, sort of a, as you say, uh, yeah, you could sort of go on forever, but I won't uh, continue because we really want to hear what he has to say. And of course, now, as you see, he is the uh, president of the Council of uh, yeah, Canadian Ac uh, Ac Academies, and um, fortunately, is a visiting scholar here at the CGP. And of course, uh, as you might expect, is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So I'll stop there, and I think we'll just get going. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Dr. Folks, for your introduction. Thanks also to the Department of Human Genetics for your uh, support of this lecture, to the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, uh, to my uh, friends at the uh, CGP, uh, Mon and Jan and others, and to those of you who are here today. Thank you for the, really, the pleasure and the honor to give the inaugural Bartha Maria Knopper's lecture. I wouldn't call this so much a, a spoiler, 
but there are two storylines I'd like you to hopefully follow as I make my way through my remarks the next 25 minutes or so. The first is that bioethics is no different from other fields with specialized languages. Bioethics uses its vocabulary to do a number of things, to propose and explicate words and terms that have moral and legal significance for decision making in the life sciences. But the innovation that I'm proposing is that apart from the words themselves, policy and specifically the many policy tools that exist should also be seen as a type of language that is used to converse in and with society. That's the, the formal storyline. The less formal storyline and the subtext uh, for, uh, for the talk is really about our, our honoree Bartha Knoppers, the person. And for those of you who know and respect Bartha, as so many of us do around the world, we know she is more than the words that she has written in her many papers the committee reports she has joined, or the policies that she has had a hand in writing herself. Policy is also about people, their hopes, their joys, their frustrations, their concerns. This storyline may be less obvious, but, but stick with me. So, so let's begin. Galileo is to have said, I'm just going to move this here because I have a few, it's easier to look. <clears throat> that mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. Now, whether he said those words exactly is the subject to considerable debate. Better? But they do seem to be the kinds of words from a polymath who was expert not only in mathematics, physics, and astronomy, but also medicine, painting and poetry. While Galileo communicated with the world in ways that are different from the specialists of today, for example, he wrote in Latin and he used secret codes when he wrote, in other ways he was no different from the curious scientists of the contemporary period. The reference to the language of the universe has a grand humanistic and possibly metaphysical purpose to communicate in ways intended to be generalizable and understood, irrespective of culture, religion, politics, but also irrespective of planets, universes, and the cosmos. This has a bit of a familiar feel. Indeed, more than 360 years after Galileo used a strange anagram to announce that he had viewed Saturn in his telescope, the first satellite to approach and take pictures of Saturn, Pioneer 11, included the now famous golden plaque depicting key messages in the event that it was found and read by others. It was a direction beacon to find Earth. Speaking of Earth, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was making a more terrestrial claim when he said that music is the universal language of all mankind. Anyone who enjoys music, whether they're listening to their latest Spotify list or sitting in a music hall and listening to opera, can identify with this grand claim. I'd like to think that just as Galileo might have smiled with the knowledge that the golden plaque on Pioneer 11 flew close to those same Saturn rings, he would also have smiled knowing that Carl Sagan had the foresight to propose that the golden record containing sounds and voices from Earth be placed aboard Voyager 1 and 2, complete with an instruction manual for decoding it in the event that anyone or anything happened across it. I'll bet he'd also like the idea that a group of Harvard scientists appear to have proved Wadsworth's assertion. From the terrestrial, things become comparatively more pedestrian, as there are countless examples of disciplines and fields that have their own specialized language and knowledge architecture. 
It was Warren Buffett who said that accounting is the language of business. The computer world has its own languages for programming, and for those of us who fly a lot, we surely appreciate that since 1951, the International Civil Aviation Organization, headquartered here in Montreal, has adopted aviation English as the language of the skies. Roger Wilco, Bartha. From, thank you. From here it gets a little murky. Wait for it, Mon. For example, English has become the de facto lingua franca of science, judging from the number of scholarly journals. But for more than 700 years, Arabic was the predominant language in which science was written and communicated. And on it goes with the specialized languages and special terms unique to architecture, law, sociology, economics, and, and philosophy. But I'll be honest, I'm less interested in which language is most used or most published or considered the most accepted. So long as we can all understand each other, that's what interests me. Ever since the Rosetta Stone unlocked the mystery of hieroglyphics, we have long sought to understand what others are saying and whether the meaning that we each wish to convey to each other is received as we each intend. Now with that introduction, I'd now like to show how these first musings apply to bioethics, policy, and genomics. I think it's fair to say that bioethics can now claim its rightful place in the history of ideas and in its applications to health and science. The Center of Genomics and Policy is one of hundreds of interdisciplinary research centers around the world inhabiting every continent except Antarctica. It's part of a global expansion of the field that includes more than 200 national bioethics commissions dozens of masters and PhD programs, and most impressively, a vast literature numbering in the hundreds of thousands of papers and books maintained online and in treasure houses like the Bioethics Research Library at Georgetown University, where I spent my graduate student years. Common to bioethics has been a commitment to applying ethical, legal, and social considerations to a variety of topics in the health sciences. In particular, there's been a laser focus on getting the words right to enable discussion and deliberation, whether one is speaking philosophically, legally, clinically, or whether the conversation is in English, French, Spanish, or Mandarin. We can track this development from the earliest compendia, such as Warren Reich's Encyclopedia of Bioethics, first published in 1978, or the multiple editions of the annual Bibliography of Bioethics, edited by my former PhD supervisor, Leroy Walters. Parsing words and critiquing their interpretation has been a valuable contribution of the bioethics community, so much so that we take it almost as a given that important terms and concepts and uh, <clears throat> the important terms and concepts have always been around, when in fact, it took the hard work of conceptual and contextual analysis, fueled by cross-disciplinary research and debate, to settle on the bioethics-focused versions of the words like those you see listed behind me. I say settle on because we still debate their meaning and application, just as we should. Even Warren Reich himself was frustrated trying to settle the debate about which of the two dominant origin stories of the word bioethics was the more accurate. And we're still arguing the point a quarter of a century later. But as bioethics evolved, so too did the stakes in the debate about words. Here's an example which is part of the early debates about embryonic stem cell research. The background, briefly, is as follows. In 1998, following the announcements by Jamie Thompson and John Gearhart that they had respectively identified and derived human embryonic stem cells and embryonic germ cells, Bill Clinton asked the National Bioethics Advisory Commission to report to him 
on the legal and moral issues of this development. In its September 7, 1999 letter, Enbach said the following, although wide agreement exists that human embryos deserve respect as a form of human life, there is disagreement both on the form such respect should take and on the level of protection owed at different stages of embryonic development. As you can appreciate, almost every word in that sentence, and especially the highlighted ones in red, were the subject of intense discussion by our staff and debate at the commission as well as in the broader public square. Two years later, a different bioethics commission under a different president assessed the prospects for a way forward when they concluded, we still have a long way to go before stem cell based therapies can be developed and made available. For now, neither side to the debate seems close to fully persuading the other of the truth it thinks it sees. These examples reflect both the strengths and limitations of the prospect of relying on agreed language for informing policy. Without agreement on the moral status of the human embryo, some thought, little progress could be made on whether stem cell research should or should not proceed. As we know, however, this did not prevent Clinton or Bush from taking a policy position. Clinton was somewhat more permissive. Bush was somewhat more restrictive which is a story for another day and perhaps another Knopper's lecture. The stem cell story is hardly unique in the world of bioethics and policy and as we have seen over the past decades. The primus inter pares is genomics, a wide field that spawns subfields looking at everything from the folding of proteins to the unique feature of the microbiome to the multiple ways in which drugs might work. The emergence of genomics was not a singular event, of course, but since we humans like to have our origin stories, I can think of no better exposition than the Human Genome Project itself. Although its official launch was October the 1st, 1990, for our purposes I propose that the confluence of genomics and policy truly started on June the 26th, 2000, when President Clinton announced that a rough draft of the human genome had been completed. Those of us privileged to be in that room that day remember Clinton's opening lines. Nearly two centuries ago in this room on this floor, Thomas Jefferson and a trusted aide spread out a magnificent map, a map Jefferson had long prayed he would get to see in his lifetime. Today the world is joining us here in the East Room to behold a map of even greater significance we are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. It was a spine tingling moment to say the least. But behind that was a policy debate. The term rough draft was itself the subject of a behind the scenes negotiation designed to help avoid the scientific awkwardness in the race to fully sequence the human genome undertaken by the Public Genome Project led by Francis Collins and the private initiative led by Craig Venter at Solera Genomics. The June 26 event marked an unofficial tie that was declared with publications occurring a day apart in Nature and Science. The rough draft behind me was the Nature version. Uh, the Science version looked a little different. But not only was rough draft a arbitrary and agreed to phrase, uh, other announcements occurred. February, uh, February 2001 was the announcement that the working draft had been completed. And of course, in April 2003, the complete sequence, all of these in quotation marks, uh, was announced to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Watson and Crick's description of the structure of DNA. Now, few could complete, compete with Clinton in the world of rhetorical flourish, but Francis Collins came close that day when he channeled literature, science, and religion, quoting Alexander Pope, know then thyself, presume not God to scan, the proper study of mankind is man. 
Collins then went on to say that it's humbling for me and awe-inspiring to realize that we have caught the first glimpse of our own instruction book, previously known only to God. Rhetorical flourishes notwithstanding, the completion of the sequence changed the face of research, jump-started a technology boom, and as a result, changed the face of research policy. Genomics practically forced itself into the policy world, eventually bringing along biotechnology, pharmacology, reproductive biology, and eventually informatics, data science, synthetic biology, international property law, patents, and most recently, AI. It's not that society has never faced a new technology and wondered how to respond to it before. The prospect of widespread use of in vitro fertilization and other new reproductive technologies in the 1980s had already alerted us to this. But without risking hyperbole, genomics was something new. Let's take a simple example. Science's ability to interrogate tiny pieces of DNA using massively powerful computers called into question the applicability of the accepted norms and practices for the ethical assessment of research using human biological materials. Those obvious ways in which it called this into question was that research could now be conducted on, on samples that were obtained once for use that may be uh, planned many years in the future, no longer requiring the continued involvement of those who donated the material. Data and information about families could be inferred from the sample taken from an individual. And the risks of physical harm were often secondary to the risks of psychological, emotional, financial, or legal harm. These considerations disrupted what might be called the standard model in research ethics review, where consent focused on participation throughout a study and information collected about a participant would be protected from abuse and disclosure. Indeed, the overall goal of the standard model was to protect against the risks of harm to individuals. My late colleague and dear friend Kimberly Quaid and I once compared the types of disclosures pictured here behind me that were typical of a randomized clinical trial on the left and of a general request for human biological materials on the right to illustrate the differences between these two uh, regimes. Since those early days, of course, even biobanks have evolved, calling for new policy to keep pace. Biobanks became the leading edge in genomics and genomics policy, and from there, the importance of groups and communities to different forms of harm and wrong, to the prospects of what types of benefits from genomic technology uh, might offer and how best the world might enjoy these benefits became far more important issues. In particular, genomics was firmly an international affair with networks, partnerships, and collaborations springing up everywhere. It presented a new mountain for policy to climb. It was no longer sufficient for policy to adapt to a new technology. It had to also accommodate domestic and international perspectives. Was that a challenge or what? So I wouldn't be standing here if I wasn't an optimist about this possibility. Uh, some years ago, uh, my colleague Alessandro Blasime and I toyed with the idea, modest that it was, of developing a theory of science policy in order to solve what our friends in science and technology studies refer to as a policy for science problem. We thought that the difficulty of coming to agreement about morally contested issues in genomics and other sciences could be mitigated with the help of a theoretical approach to handle those differences. We observed that science has become especially challenging for policymaking precisely because liberal democracies lack a coherent way to accommodate pluralistic views about scientific innovation. We thought that a first step towards the construction of a political theory of science policy would be to account for pluralism at the level of diverse epistemic commitments held by different players in public scientific controversies. It struck us that epistemic pluralism was both the fact of the world and an impediment. If you recall the quote from the Bush Bioethics Commission I showed earlier, for now, neither side to the debate seems close to fully persuading the other of the truth it thinks it sees. You can see that this is not simply an interesting philosophical question. Epistemic pluralism may help to explain how it is that a technology can be encouraged in one country, merely permitted in another, and quite possibly prohibited in a third, but it is silent on how agreement 
among countries is possible. It's here that I believe that imagining policy as a language may offer some insights. Because in the real world, some problems can't wait for agreement on fundamental epistemic or moral commitments. Policy cannot afford the luxury of complete evidence, a tightly reasoned ethics argument, or an ironclad legal precedent in order to make progress. Policy is messy. So what exactly am I referring to when I talk about policy? This is what I mean, and I mean it in its most expansive sense, as the set of governance tools to be used to help formalize processes for making better decisions. This toolbox, and I'm using the rule of not putting too many things on a PowerPoint slide, is incomplete. And unfortunately, also missing from this toolbox is the instruction manuals for each of those tools and how best to use them. But I'm going to take one example, one small example, the moratorium. This may seem an unusual tool to highlight when there are other obvious choices like laws, regulations, standards, or treaties. I selected moratoria for a particular reason. It's because the moratorium is a bit of a slippery tool. There are no formal rules for how they are requested, by whom, for what purpose, and with what conditions attached for any lifting of a moratorium. They don't even have a formal definition uh, for research. Our friend Bob Cook Deegan wrote a wonderful analysis on moratoria three decades ago, and his tongue-in-cheek definition was, a moratorium is a ban I don't want to call a ban. Among the best examples and earliest of the use of a moratorium was the one applied to research involving recombinant DNA molecules. The series of events in the early 1970s is probably well known to many of you, but the main highlights are as follows. A proposal by Nobel laureate Paul Berg and his graduate student Janet Mertz was developed to splice a monkey virus, SV40, and a bacterial phage and inserting the new construct into a bacterium. This, not surprisingly, met with considerable concern at labs around the country. Two meetings were convened at the Asilomar Conference Center in California, the second of which, held in February 1975, produced a set of recommendations and a call for a voluntary moratorium by all scientists working in this area of research. By the time the recommendations were published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, I mistakenly wrote science, it's the PNAS there, only four months later, the NIH had already adopted them as the initial guidelines for use by its recombinant DNA advisory committee. As Bob noted when he wrote about this case in 1998, the voluntary moratorium, largely con uh, conceived and imposed by the molecular biology community, on itself, thus was supplanted by a federally sanctioned set of guidelines and a prospective group review process. No violations of the voluntary phase of the recombinant DNA moratorium were known to have occurred up until 1998. Those same NIH guidelines remained in place, updated every now and again, until 2021. The art form of a moratorium was taken to new and different heights following the birth of Dolly on July the 5th, 1996, and her formal introduction to the world on February 24th, 1997. Only 10 days after the presentation of the lamb that shocked the world, Clinton announced a ban on the use of federal funding for cloning research and in assigning the world's most daunting homework, asked the National Bioethics Advisory Commission to undertake a thorough review of the legal and ethical issues and report back to me within 90 days. NBAC produced that report on June the 9th, which began with the following conclusion. The Commission concludes at this time that it is morally unacceptable for anyone in the public or private sector, whether in research or the clinical setting, to attempt to create a child using somatic cell nuclear transfer cloning. This was followed by a recommendation to continue the current moratorium ban on the use of federal funding, a request that the private sector voluntarily comply with the intent of the federal moratorium, a suggestion that professional and scientific societies make clear that this would be irresponsible and unprofessional if it occurred, 
and a call for federal legislation to prevent anyone from undertaking this work. Only some of these actions were taken up. And as should be obvious, these two cases, the recombinant DNA case and the cloning case, were not as straightforward as they may seem or as I have presented them. In the case of the Asilomar recombinant DNA moratorium, its main purpose can be described as a legitimate concern registered by the scientific community that they were not confident enough in the safety of the science that they were undertaking that they wished to defer research until those concerns were addressed. A less charitable explanation may have been that they preferred self-regulation over government regulation. I suspect both were true. In the case of human cloning, safety and the risks of harm were certainly uppermost uh, in the Commission's mind and many others, but so too were the moral and for many the certain theological values that were at stake. Questions about the moral status of a fetus, an embryo, or an embryonic stem or germ cell, personhood, potential harms to future generations were all part of the admixture that contributed to national and international discussions. One might even argue that having access to a National Bioethics Commission, one of the other tools in the box, was usefully deployed by the White House to put some daylight between Dolly's announcement and any decision that they might have to make. I believe all of these things were true. Now, moratoria are not ancient artifacts of long ago genetics debates. More recently, a proposed moratorium on heritable gene editing shared some similarities with past efforts in that there was a call for a pause in research. But unlike the examples I mentioned, which were US in origin, this call recognized the scientific and moral issues as global in impact from the outset. This group called for, among other things, a global moratorium on all clinical uses of human germline editing, a fixed period which would provide time to establish an international framework and the recognition that once a framework was established, nations might choose to follow separate paths. They even went out of their way to say that it wasn't a ban. Now, it should be obvious to you, I hope, that similar case studies can be done for other genetics and genomic technology, whether alone or in combination. Moreover, the policy tools being deployed by non-governmental and governmental actors alike is now typical. Here's a snapshot of some of those actors. You will see, for example, the Royal Commission on New Reproductive Technologies, whose 1999 report has influenced new, rec new NRT law for decades. You will see UNESCO, whose 1997 Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights was adopted by the full United Nations. Or more recently, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which has used to quote its website, and uses open source standards, frameworks, and tools to empower responsible genomic data use worldwide. You will also see the LSAR program at Genome Canada, which required of all large-scale sequencing grants recipients that a bioethics component be embedded in the project. This was not just a nice thing to do. It was a policy innovation reflecting a long tradition at Genome Canada of embedding bioethics into the conditions of grant award. Genome Canada at that time called it genomics, ethics, environment, and uh, economics, and law, uh, and social issues, a mouthful that required simplifying it to GELS. And of course, GELS was itself modeled on another mouthful, ELSI, the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Program of the Human Genome Project, that Jim Watson and later Francis Collins convinced the U.S. Congress to fund and fully integrate. Now, were I a more accomplished PowerPointer, uh, I would have figured out how to put the two toolbox slides together and then explain to you how different groups use different tools. It's a very exciting thing. Maybe there's a, a master's project that someone can figure out. I'm, I'm not capable of doing it. But this, my friends, is what I mean when I say that policy is an international language of bioethics. Just as using the right word at the right time in the right way to convey the right meaning is a key to joint understanding, so too is selecting the right policy tool to convey the right strategy or tactic to solve the right problem at the right time. 
Now, you will determine by now, I'm sure, that there's a common thread running all through all of these groups. Bartha. Bartha has participated in one way or another in all of them, and many more. She has written many of the words found in the declarations, SOPs, frameworks, and guidelines that they produced. She has also shown that policy development and use is a conversation, a journey, not a destination. It begins first with agreeing on what the problem is that needs to be solved, and then deciding how best to solve it. Bartha knows, and we should probably get wristbands, what would Bartha say, as we all do, that policy is also not one thing. It is a collection of procedures and processes that are intended to organize the way people interact with each other. It is iterative. It is frustrating. It is confusing. It leads to disagreements. Disagreements on facts, on values, on priorities, and on the words that eventually make their way into a final product. Policy without the right words is just paper. But policy without people has no value at all. The bioethics, genomics, and policy world understands this, and it understands it because of people like Bartha. This world is better off because of Bartha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Meslin. I think we're going to open it up for a Q&A uh, session. So thank you very much, Lindsay. Sure. For any questions from the audience? She's not allowed. <laughs> it's going to be a hard question. Chair, you chose one of my favorite topics. I'll get a chance to thank you in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> moratoria, or moratorium, can also give uh, rise to the illusion that um, something has been taken care of and that everything will stop in few. Governments don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about the law. Don't need to be drafted, uh, codes of conduct, whatever. So they are sometimes a facile, politicized tool to um, comfort rather than disturb. What do you think? Um, it may not surprise you um, that I would agree with almost every word since they're talking about words. And it's really one of the reasons that I showed those three in particular. Um, if there were a Nobel Prize for a really good policy initiative in bioethics, I would list the events that began at Asilomar actually in 1973 um, and moved all the way uh, through to the present day because it has all of the features that one might look for in an idealized policy approach. The scientific community, the most knowledgeable group about what was happening, themselves recognized through great integrity, through great hubris, um, through concern. And yes, they might have been worried if we don't do something, we're going to be prevented from doing something by people who don't know what they're talking about. But I prefer to take the first view as the dominant view. That led to not simply a, we're going to write a little paper and hope people read it. It became adopted, picked up by an enlightened, at that time, uh, NIH, which was supported by an enlightened, believe it or not, U.S. Congress. I'll say it again, believe it or not, there used to be a time when the U.S. Congress was quite enlightened. Um, I'm being a little bit dramatic because I don't think it's terribly enlightened at this point. Not a big, a big point. You also had the NIH establishing a particular type of mechanism, the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, which had a working group which developed points to consider, which gave rise to further guidelines. So that case is a fabulous case. The gene editing moratorium, I would say, drifts far closer to the other extreme that Bartha was describing. Seven people wrote that paper, by the way, or excuse me, uh, 10 people wrote the paper from seven countries, all very distinguished people known to many of us uh, in this room. First author, Eric Lander, for goodness sakes. Uh, I, don't dis I don't in any way discount what they did or why they did it. 
But the, the likely input, impact of that kind of statement was political, not practical, whereas the Asilomar action was, to me, far more practical than it was political. So it's a spectrum. Thank you. Dr. Fuchs? Thanks, Senator. I want to take a moment you just made about um, looking sensible. I mean, um, the phrase from the the center cannot hold. Things will apart the center cannot hold. Now, at the current time, it seems to be, even in Canada, I'm worried about the center hold, because all this depends on the center So, do you have any thoughts, recommendations, <coughs> hope that it's um, good? I got a long list. Um, it's a great question. I'll keep the sort of uh, the answer is as short as I can. I share your concern, and I think anyone who uh, thinks this is just sort of phase, some passing little phase, is mistaken. This is not a passing phase. We have plenty of examples um, through the misinformation, disinformation lens uh, that arose during COVID uh, to the debates that we're having right now in funding science in our own parliament. Um, you know, I, I'm not risking any kind of uh, um, punishment, but the organization that I, that I run, the Council of Canadian Academies, is waiting for funding from the federal government that was supposed to have been announced in January. Universities are waiting to hear. Granting organizations are, we're all waiting. Why is that the case? Is it that we lack the capacity to walk and chew gum at the same time? Is it that we don't have a national science policy a national innovation policy. We have lots of visionary statements and lots of programs. So my concern, that's a reflection back, at, back to you. Um, the only thing I would, if I were to recommend anything, is I think we need to have, this is gonna sound so counterintuitive, I think we can't make this about science. I know that sounds very strange, but my experience in a number of different countries is that when you start talking about science and science policy, kind of a, the, the blinkers go on. This isn't about science. It's about prosperity. It's about health. It's about, it's about anything that happens to be around that cabinet table. So if there, were, if there would be any piece of advice that I would give, it would be ironically, when you go to talk about science, don't talk about science. It's like we learned a long time ago, don't go into some office and say, I'm here to talk about ethics. And I go, oh, great. Here's the ethics police telling us what we can't do. And like, no, no, we're not like that. We like science. We, like, as soon as they think you're the ethics person, you've lost it. So it's a, that's the, the piece that Alessandro and I wrote, which, by the way, hasn't become a full theory yet. It's a work in progress. Really gets to this issue of how to think about making decisions in a pluralistic society when there are diverse views and, and legitimate ones. I'm not even talking about the extreme views. So it's to de-scientify, de de, to, to at least reduce the emphasis on saying, we scientists need more money. We scientists are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for your presentation. Um, I think you've comment about Arthur having known her for a long time, one of the things that was very evident from the very beginning is she wasn't looking at ethics and laws of discipline, but what was the problem that needed to be solved, and how does one move whatever happens to be the solution of that problem forward by bringing all aspects of what is important in life to that problem. But it brings me to the reason that I think ties into what you were saying, going back to maybe a mild form of mathematics. I look at ethics in the same way I look at how I've been taught statistics, where in fact you're supposed to design your question with the statistics in advance, not pulling in the statistics. And what I really worry about, and I know probably Mark thinks it's ethics has become like an industry or a section that you then have to put into a grant, and therefore when you, I try to bring an ethicist in at the beginning when we're discussing, it's like, no, no, either that may buy us, or we may not get funding, or may have compromised our own area when we need to get funding, therefore don't bring us in there, bring us in later. And I think that it has to be like statistics, the design of the project, and the science has to come in. So we never be um, Thank you. It's a, a great uh, comment. I'll 
I'll turn it into a question, but Eric, what do you think about that? Okay, now I can give you my answer. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and there's lots that we all could say ab about this. I'll give you one ex simple example um, from one of my former lives uh, that, uh, that Dr. Folks mentioned. When I was at Indiana University for uh, 15 years, several interesting things happened. One was the Dean of Medicine made me an Associate Dean in the medical school. I was the first such person in North America, as far as I know. I didn't have power or authority. He did it because he wanted me as part of what he called the deanery, the small group of people that reported to him. That was a very interesting political statement on behalf of a dean, uh, that I was valued like the Dean of Education, uh, like the, right? Second thing is when we built our brand new NIH funded um, clinical translational science building, the Indiana CTSI it's called, the architecture of that building was designed to be integrating all of these fields. I shared the floor, ironically, with biostatistics. And not because we both started with bio, but it was built as an environment where everyone would, we say this comfortably now, but 15 years ago, it wasn't so obvious, the common coffee pot bumping into people in the lobby issue. It was designed, I was given, I was gonna do a dramatic thing, I don't have a pen, I was given a pencil and the architectural drawing of the third floor by the dean that said, here's your space, design your space that optimizes how you can work with others. So there are lots of things that may not seem obvious. You know, there's the policy and we ought to protest and write a letter, true. Um, I don't wanna go where I would love to go and that is to thank you for making your observation that when you invite ethics people into the room, it shouldn't be that, oh, they're gonna, we shouldn't really invite them because they are inveterate fun suckers. You know, they, they take the fun out of everything, they put a break on, they say no to everything. I will say without overstating that there are a few of us, led by my friend, who actually like science, who want to see science progress and think it's unethical if science doesn't, right? There's a whole, now that's gonna take a couple of generations and for the younger uh, students who are here, that's, that's my request to you. A bunch of us worked our tails off to try and get into the room. You know the Hamilton play, there's a great song in the room where it happened. We've been in those rooms or the next to the room where the thing happened. Um, the East Room was a cool room to be in, but getting in the room was what our accomplishment was. Staying in the room and being a legitimate um, participant in those discussions is the, is the next step. It's gonna take a few generations. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Eric uh, and David, for your remark. I remember when I was lured over the mountain after 22 years at University of Moya, and they said, well, where, where, where do you want to be located? Uh, there's this building on, on Peel, and there's this other one we have on, okay, let's see, let's say Elmer. I said, no, I want to I wanna understand what I'm talking about. I need, I need to have access to the scientists, and you can't make policy, you know, it doesn't grow on trees. But Eric, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for showing all the other adjectives that we could use that policy making is both an art and a science. Absolutely beautiful lecture. I'm very honored to have what is the you know, poker term? Is the ante or what's it? Up the ante, that's yep. it. For future inaugural lectures, I'd like to personally thank you. I have a small um, gift, which I think you left behind in the desk. <laughs> In the desk we uh, thank you right so now. much <laughs> i my mug thank you all you've been a great audience actually, Bye -bye. actually no we have a, a proper we we have um, something gift. for you but if i may just a, a a few quick words first of all thank you very much eric for for being here and for honoring us and for honoring professor knoppers um the lecture the martha maria knoppers lecture is, is really meant to celebrate three things it's meant to celebrate human rights, it's meant to celebrate interdisciplinarity, and it's meant to celebrate profiles of courage. And we're very happy to 
for you, Dr. Meslin, for being our inaugural speaker. You've talked a lot about the power of language. It's really hard to put in language the gratitude that we all have for you, Professor Knoppers, and this is a small little thing for you. Um, And, and now for the for the the awards. So if you can kindly um, bring it.